morning. Pastor Jane will be with us in just a moment. Good to have all of you here this morning as we gather to worship, as we gather to um, hear some singing, and as we gather to be God's people in this place at this time. Uh, as we gather, one of the first things we want to uh, bring to talk about is we have some prayer concerns this week. Um, please keep uh, John Becker, O.J. Rumstock, and Joseph Brown in your prayers. Uh, all three have been hospitalized. Uh, John and Franciscan, uh, Joseph at Gunderson, O.J. was at um, Franciscan, but he is now at Sparta. Yeah, so um, please continue to keep those gentlemen in your prayers as they seek God's healing in many of these ways. Uh, as we begin our worship, one of the things we want to draw, I want to draw your attention to is the bulletin insert that you have. This is part of our stewardship emphasis that we've been doing this month. Um, the, the bulletin insert this week talks about part of our plan for next year, our hope, our plan, our dream, which is to expand our youth ministry position from being very part-time to being full-time. We're going to have a temple talk about that in just a moment. What I want to also let you know is that as we think about this, um, we culminate our stewardship emphasis next Sunday. <coughs> we that you will join us. A mailing went out Friday, so you should get it Monday or Tuesday, I hope. The mailing includes uh, a brochure about what we're doing, a letter, and then also a statement of intent card. In the past, we've used an estimate of giving. Some churches use a pledge card. We want to think of this as statements of intent, our intention. Intentions can change. Sometimes intentions have to change. We understand that. But this is the intent, and it's very important that we get those back because that will help us determine what we can do, what the resources will be available as we move into um, 2020. This week we have a temple talk by Jeff Rich. Jeff was unable to be here this morning because of some business uh, conflicts. So when you watch the, the, um, the video, pretend he's over here, except he's really over here. And if as you hear and watch the video, you decide, you could, especially if you're in the back, you couldn't hear it as well as you'd like to hear it, it is on the front page of our website. I put it on there this morning. It's a YouTube link. So you can go home and link to that. You can also see the temple talks from the past couple weeks, as well as downloading the bulletin inserts from the last two weeks. I'll get this week's bulletin insert downloaded probably by tomorrow morning. Um, but that will be on the page, front page of the website as well. The other thing you can do is out on the, um, the television screen out in the gathering area, we have kind of a scrolling marquee of pictures um, uh, that tells a little bit of the story of what we are hoping to do with our um, with our plan for next year and how the stewardship emphasis for this fall fits into that. So I'm going to share uh, Jeff's uh, presentation with you, and then we'll continue with our worship. So I got the tech work done right, which is always problematic. I should have it right here.
practice. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about it during the sermon. And then next week, we hope that you'll be with us. By the way, we promise a party next week. We've got cake from Linda's. I've already paid the bill. <clears throat> it's coming. We'll have cake from Linda's. We'll have punch. Uh, especially between services, and if you slide in like late for 10 30, maybe we can slip you a piece of cake after worship. So please join us next week as we celebrate what God is doing in our midst and what God is uh, gifting to us and what God challenges us to be as a community. <laughs> and bring your 10 cards. Pastor Jean, it's yours. As you are comfortable, would you please rise for confession and forgiveness on page 211 in the front of the hymnal, page 211. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us confess our sins and to God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The opening hymn is number 453.
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. The saying is sure, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does no good but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. Right, rightly explaining the word of truth, the word of the Lord.
So I brought something with me this morning. I brought my camera. And this kind of a camera, you saw this in the game called service, so you just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> no giving off the secret. No secret. Okay, so I got this camera, and this is my camera. It's, it's kind of a, a camera that um, needs something. It needs a lens. See, the can't, can't take a picture like this because you need a lens that goes on the front of the camera. And so about a year ago, I was telling Pastor Jean that for Christmas, I'd really like a new lens. It's kind of a, it's called a prime lens, if you care about that kind of thing. And, and so you know what? Lo and behold, guess what happened? I got the prime lens for Christmas, see? And so the lens, it works like this. I have this little cap comes off, and then you take this little cap off, and you put the lens, <coughs> You line up the red dots, and you put the lens on here, and you click it into place, and you're ready to take pictures. So on Christmas morning, I opened up my Christmas present, and there was my lens. How cool is that? So what do you think I need to do now? Now that I have the two lenses, now that I've got my lens, what, what do I have to do first? Put it together, okay? So we're going to take this cap off. That's what it kind of looks like inside, okay? But see, it won't, it won't take a picture. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll snap, but, but that's all you get. That's all you get. White. White. And, you know, I mean, in January, that might be all we get anyway, but you still get it. And then you take this off, like this, okay? And you match up the red dots. Match up the red dots. And you click it into place and take the lens crap off. And now... Should I take a picture of you? Ooh, there you go. I got yours. Yeah, I got you. Oh, they're right there, the two of you. Oh, that's a good picture. And you know, wait, wait, wait. Okay, smile. Somebody had their eyes closed. Why did you get past your jean? I got all sorts of pictures. Good night. I have lots of fun with that. See? See all the pictures I got? Delete them? Well, maybe, maybe later. No, no, no. But wait a minute. Okay, so we took the covers off, we put it on, we turned on the camera, we took pictures. I'm thinking we missed something. Anybody have an idea what we might have missed? Before we get there. Oh, what do you think? Did she get it? She got it. She nailed it. You know what I forgot? I didn't say thank you. I mean, when I got the, got the lens, and I, and I opened up the package, if I just took the covers off and put it on and started taking pictures, did I say thank you? Yeah. <laughs> you guys need to help me, okay? So here's what you're gonna do. We're gonna, I want you to look at Pastor Jean, and on the count of three, we're all gonna say thank you. Okay, see if I can make up for it. One, two, three. Thank you! Whew, boy, that, that bails me out of that. Now, you know, sometimes, I know your moms and dads say, you gotta, give, you gotta say thank you to people. You know, if your grandma gives you something, you send her a thank you note. And that's good manners, but there's something bigger going on here. Who gives us things? Jesus gives us stuff, doesn't he? Who gives us everything we have? Jesus. Who gives us everything possible? Who gives us everything we need? Ikea! No, not Ikea. <laughs> It's not that good. <laughs> you know what? God gives us everything we have. And so it's important for us to thank God for everything. And sometimes we forget to do that. You know, sometimes we don't do it like we should. So here's my, here's what I want you to do. First of all, listen carefully to the gospel reading I'm going to share. It's about ten guys. Nine of you heard this in Sunday school, didn't you? Nine of them, what did they do? Did they say thank you? No. Uh, what did the one guy do? He said thank you. So then I want you to think, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, you'll hear the story again. At the end of worship today, the close.
closing hymn is about giving thanks to God, so listen for that. And then when you go home, like when your mom or dad puts, gets you lunch, you say thank you to mom or dad, but you also thank, thank God, right? Or maybe when you go to bed tonight, you crawl into bed, and you say, oh, it's been such a long day, it's a really good day. Thank you, God, for being with me. Or you wake up in the morning, you go, oh, boy. But I thank God, it's Monday, and I thank God that God got me through the night and was with me and cared for me, right? Right? See, we thank God for everything we have. So I want you to remember, I want you to remember to give thanks to God for everything, including your moms and dads, your bigs and bigger and younger, the little brothers and sisters, your grandmas and grandpas, all the food you have to eat, all the toys you have to play with. Thank God for God's love, okay? Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. You guys can go back to your seats and as they return to the seats, I'm going to invite the congregation for real this time. Yes. Thank you. You can go back and I invite you to stand as you're comfortable for the gospel application. as they are about the possibilities that are in front of us. 
The problem is if I do that, my guess is the reaction from you will be, well, no, duh. I'm the pastor. I'm supposed to be excited about this stuff. So I'm excited about something else. I am excited about the gospel reading that I just shared with you. This is one of my favorite stories. Okay, so here's what's happening. It's, it's Luke 17, and in, in this part of Luke, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. We all know what that's going to mean, you know, we all know where that's going to lead. But he's on his way to Jerusalem, and he passes through this village, and on the edge of town, as he gets to the edge of town, he is met by ten lepers. Now, leprosy in the, in the biblical times was a dreaded disease. It's actually called Hansen's disease, is, is what the term means now. And, and we know, we understand the disease now, and we understand how to treat it. And, and how to care for it, how to prevent it. And so it really is no longer the devastating disease it once was. But in biblical times, you know, with no medical knowledge, they didn't know what to do. And so they did the only thing they could do. They took lepers, they separated them from their families, they took them from their homes, and they exiled them to the edge of town so that nobody else would get infected with leprosy. So a leper was removed from everything that was a part of his or her life, and a leper had no future. They lived on the edge of town, and that's the best they could do. And so as Jesus comes into town and he meets these lepers, the lepers cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Do you hear that anywhere else? How about... How about in the liturgy today? Kyrie eleison. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. What we say in the liturgy comes right from this text. So they cry out to Jesus, Lord, have mercy. Okay, so Jesus says, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go show yourself to the priests. Really? Okay, here's why. There are no doctors to go to. There's no Gunderson or Franciscan or Mayo Clinic. So you go to the priest. The priest is the one who says, you have leprosy. You need to leave. Yeah, I know. You need to leave your family and leave everything behind. The priest is also the one who puts you back in. So go show yourselves to the priest. So off they go. Do, 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 do. They go off to see the priest. And on the way, they suddenly realize, hey, look, look, it's not here. It's gone. I mean, leprosy is kind of like a rash. You know, it's kind of like a, like, it's like a rash. It's gone. I'm cleansed, I'm clean, I'm healed. And they run off to the priests because the priests will then allow them to return to life and have the fullness and richness of life and have a future. Except for one of them. And he was a Samaritan. Jews and Samaritans hate each other. The Samaritan is the one who says, oh, now, remember what he was told? He was told to go to the priests. He breaks the commandment turns around and he returns to Jesus in order to give thanks. And then something happens. Jesus says, your faith has saved you. You have been made well. Here's why that's important. Earlier in the story, we are told that they're cleansed and they are healed. And all of them are. There is no reason to doubt that all ten are cleansed and healed. But the one who came back is made well. The Greek word is sozo. And the Greek word sozo has, has elements of salvation in it. The one who came back, all ten are healed. All ten are healed. All ten are cleansed. But the one who came back got a lot of He is the one who is made well, who is restored, not only in his physical life, but he is given the gift of salvation and restored with Jesus. And that happens because he comes back and enters a relationship with Jesus. The relationship with Jesus changes him completely. I have a picture at home in my photo album. It's a picture from September of 1986. It is taken on top of a place called Sugarloaf Mountain, which is right outside of Marquette, Michigan. The top of Sugarloaf Mountain, after you climb 159 steps, you get to the top, and there's this incredible vista of Lake Superior and a little place called Press Isle, which is a little island off of the city of Marquette. 
I went there in September of 1986. Um, I had started in my first call in a little town called Nagani, just outside of Marquette. I started my first call in July of 86. Didn't do much youth stuff. I was the associate pastor, but so youth work. There was not much you could do the first couple months in the summer. But in September, I got the kids together, and we went up to Sugarloaf Mountain, and the picture is of three young ladies, Tracy Anderson, Angela Balzarini, and Angela's sister, Teresa. Now, I saved the picture, I treasure the picture, because I didn't know it at the time, but Teresa would become my sister-in-law eight years later. Okay? She met my brother, and well, you know, all those things. Um, but I remember that event. I remember that event. I remember that, that first event, that first youth event, climbing up, getting to know the kids, building relationships, which is so incredibly important. Having a good time, enjoying God's gift of creation. But I need to tell you, there probably wasn't a lot of sudso going on there. That is to say, we had a wonderful time. We began to build relationships. But I'm not sure we did a whole lot with Jesus. We had a good time. What I was doing was reflecting what I was told at the time. One of my council members in that congregation was the high school principal. And he told me, he said, what, what we need, we need wholesome activities for our young people. And he is absolutely right, we do. The problem is, that's not what we are here for. The church is not here simply to provide wholesome activities for young people. I'm not saying we shouldn't have good times. I shouldn't say, not saying we shouldn't have fun. You know, we try to have a little bit of fun. We enjoy each other. We build relationships. But if that's all that we do, we miss the rest of the story. We become like the lepers who go off to see the priests who are cleansed and healed, but are not necessarily made well. You heard Jen Lindsay say last week that there are a lot of activities for kids in this community, and she just she, she just is so grateful for that, and I am too. As a parent and as a pastor, I am so grateful that our community, through the schools and the Boys and Girls Club and other organizations, we have got a lot of activities for kids. I don't think what I was told in 1986 applies. It is not our mission to provide wholesome activities for young people. That's not to say they're not bad, they're not good, they are very good, but we need to give something more than that we need to get kids connected with Jesus. Because when we're connected with Jesus, when we're in that relationship with Jesus, then we experience sunso. We experience being made well, being restored, and having the fullness of life through the crucified and risen Jesus. That's what we're called to be as a community. And so as we think about this you know, plan for next year, we're not talking about the possibility of hiring a full-time games and activities director. That's not what we're here for. And we hope that a new youth, or a full-time youth position will also work with families. They're not there to be social workers with families. Social workers are wonderful. I love social workers. We need social workers. They do God's work, but that's not our calling. Our calling is to help them to grow to navigate the challenges of life, especially with kids, but to do so with an eye to the presence of Jesus. The presence of the crucified and risen Jesus who changes our life, who gives us so, so who gives us salvation and hope and fullness. And not just for our kids, but for our adults too for parents, for moms and dads, for grandparents, for people who are single and married, for people who are kind of alone or lonely, and people who are just, you know, abounding in family around them. For all of God's people to find new and different ways to be engaged in a relationship with Jesus and to experience the fullness of God's gift of life. One of the really neat ways I see that happening is um, two ways, really. In our confirmation program we, on, on Wednesdays, we have, we have a, a wonderful group of quilting ladies. We sent off the quilts yesterday, 248 of them, went off to the boxcar yesterday morning, um, and they got there. Okay. Um, so, so when we have early release on Wednesdays, one of the confirmation elective, electives for 7th and 8th graders is for the 7th and 8th graders to come over, two of them, only two, because they're all overwhelming, but they come over and they work with the quilting ladies hours. Then they get to have treats at 3 o'clock. The treats are the best part. I mean, if you want treats at 3 o'clock on Wednesday, join the quilting ladies. They have great treats. 
but they, they come and, and they work and with, the, with the quilting ladies. And what I'm hoping is happening is that these kids are looking at these quilting ladies who are working to serve others and see in their eyes Jesus. And maybe at the same time, the quilting ladies look at these kids and say, there's Jesus. You know, we're in the presence of God's gift. And then, how many of you have ever been, how many of you have been group guides for confirmation? Those of you guides in the building, or are group guides? You have been the presence of Jesus. Think about that for a moment. As you build a relationship, you're not just being a, a nice person, you're not just being a pal, you know? You are the presence of Christ in the life of the kids with whom you work. Those are just two small ways in which we seek to do that, and it becomes reciprocal. Because not only do we hope that the kids see Jesus in our eyes, maybe in the eyes of a young person. Hi, I see Jesus. I see Jesus. And I experience that. And I realize that our God is a very intimate and imminent God. Very imminent in our world right around us, but also very intimate. Knows me well. And loves me dearly. And in the person of Jesus, that's what we experience. We experience God's embrace. We experience God filling us with life and holy and love. That's what sucks all about. The encounter with the crucified and risen Christ. Amen. We continue with the singing of hymn number 886. If you are comfortable, would you please join us?
as the earth brings forth its fruit, renew your creation, so that all creatures are sustained and nourished. Lord, in your mercy. The heritage of nations belongs to you and your spirit fills the earth. With presidents, prime ministers, and chancellors, lawmakers, judges, governors, and county officials, so that they reflect your faithfulness and uprightness in the world of the people. Lord, we are mercy.
given us, which we bring to your table, and with them the offering of our lives. Nourish us now with the life that really is life, revealed to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord.
body and blood, our hearts have been refreshed. Send us now to shine with your goodness and bear witness to the one we have received, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
Go in peace, live in love, as Christ loved us.